an introduction to nucleophilic addition to ketones and aldehydes. That'll be the major topic of this lesson, and we're going to find out that most of the reactions of this chapter are going to be a type of nucleophilic addition. We'll just be varying what nucleophiles we add. So it turns out ketones and aldehydes having a partially positive carbon right there are pretty decent electrophiles, and there's therefore a whole host of different nucleophiles we can add to them. Uh, we'll also specifically be covering the hydration of ketones and aldehydes, as well as talking about relative reactivities of ketones and aldehydes in these nucleophilic addition reactions. Now this lesson's part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Okay, so we want to take a real generic look at nucleophilic addition here, and once again, this carbonyl carbon right here has a partial positive charge, and that's what makes it electrophilic. And having a partial positive charge here with a carbon oxygen double bond, so again, uh, when you've got a double or triple bond, that bond is way more polar than the analogous single bond. And so a carbon oxygen double bond much more polar than a carbon oxygen single bond, resulting in this carbon having significant amount more partial positive charge. And so there's a variety of different nucleophiles we can add. I'm just going to have generic nucleophile here. And, uh, one thing we can do here is just nucleophilic attack, i.e. attaching our nucleophile there. And to make room to make that new bond right here, we'll just push these electrons up to the electronegative oxygen, leaving him, at least temporarily in this example, with a negative charge. And so in this case, we'll have this right here, and then we'll have attached our nucleophile right here as well. So what generally occurs at this point is we're going to protonate this oxygen to form an alcohol. Cool, and so there's the result. And so uh, we talked about addition reactions way back with alkenes, and when we did addition with an alkene, we added something to both sides of a carbon-carbon double bond. Now we're going to add, be adding something to both sides of a carbon-oxygen double bond. And what's nice is the oxygen's always going to be getting a hydrogen in all the reactions we look at. So whereas what is going to be added to the carbonyl side of that double bond? Just a variety of different nucleophiles. And we'll look at uh, oxygen nucleophiles, nitrogen nucleophiles, and carbon nucleophiles, as well as hydrogen nucleophiles, somewhere throughout this chapter. Now, one thing to note, this can be done both with and without acid catalysis. And so the, the process I've kind of shown here um, is really generic. And we'll see a little bit different mechanism when there's acid catalysis. So what you'll find out is sometimes instead of like having nucleophilic attack occurring and then protonating the oxygen, sometimes you'd actually start by protonating the oxygen and then doing the nucleophilic attack. And we'll specify where those are. We'll also find out that some of these reactions are not going to stop right here. So we'll find out that a lot of the reactions are going to occur in under acidic conditions. And you guys learned back in the alcohol chapter that under acidic conditions, you can protonate that OH which is a bad leaving group, but once you protonate it and form water, it becomes a good leaving group and it can leave. And that either makes room for a second equivalent of your nucleophile to attach, or it allows the possibility of maybe an elimination reaction occurring, leading to the formation of a pi bond. And we'll specify, you know, when those are, and they're not so much like you got to know how would I predict this. It's you need, once we show it to you, we want it to make sense to you, but then you need to remember that's what that reaction ultimately results in. Okay, a couple other things we need to talk about here. And so here I've got a generic ketone acetone, and here I've got acetaldehyde, a typical aldehyde. And then we've got a special case of formaldehyde with hydrogens on both sides. And just wanna kind of make this analogous to certain carbocations here. So let's say I've got a secondary carbocation, a primary carbocation, and then a methyl carbocation. And you guys learned that the more substituted carbocation is more stable. And the idea is that these carbons are going to be donating electron density through hyperconjugation, you might recall, uh, to donate a little bit of electron density towards this carbocation, making it less positive and more stable. Well, in this case, we've got a partially positive carbon. So due to this polar bond right here, so it's not a carbocation per se, but it is a partially positive carbon in all three cases. And it turns out the more carbons it's bonded to, they're gonna be donating some electron density towards it in the same sense we saw here with carbocation, making it less positive. Now in this case, our carbocations are usually intermediates. And usually there's something we're trying to form in some sort of rate determining step. And when we make them more stable, we form them faster. So, but here, these aren't the intermediates. These are the reactants in these nucleophilic addition reactions. And if I make them more stable, I make them less reactive and they react slower in these nucleophilic addition reactions. And so in this case, it turns out ketones are gonna have a less 
partial positive charge on that carbonyl carbon and be weaker electrophiles than say an aldehyde. And then a typical aldehyde even weaker so than formaldehyde. And so what we're gonna see is that there's an increasing reactivity as we go from a ketone to an aldehyde to formaldehyde. In all of these different nucleophilic addition reactions, it doesn't really matter which nucleophile you choose. So formaldehyde will always be the most reactive, then an aldehyde, and then a typical ketone. Cool, now it turns out it's not just electronic effects. It's not just about how partially positive the carbonyl carbon is. It turns out that sterics also play a role. So hydrogen being the smallest thing. So when our nucleophile attacks this sp2 hybridized carbon, this is trigonal, planar, and flat. And you can either attack from the front face or from the back face. And the smaller these two atoms are, or groups, whatever they might be, so the, the easier the access and the faster the attack. And so with two hydrons, sterics are the best. And so not only is this the most reactive due to electronic effects, due to the most partial positive carbonyl carbon, and then therefore the greatest electrophile in that respect, but also the sterics are the easiest here as well for the approach of the nucleophile. And then aldehydes after that, and then ketones would have the most sterics. And sometimes, you know, the bulkier these carbon chains become, so the more sterics and the less reactive that ketone gets as well. So sometimes, you know, the general trend of ketones are the least reactive, then aldehydes, and then formaldehyde. So, but sometimes they'll even vary the ketones with some bulkier carbon chains on both sides as well. And you've just got to be able to rank reactivities for ketones and aldehydes. Okay, so this first reaction, this first nucleophilic addition to ketones and aldehydes is called hydration. And uh, if you are going to undergo hydration as a human, you're going to add water to yourself. You're going to drink some water or some Gatorade or something along these lines. And so hydration is the addition of water across that carbon oxygen double bond. And kind of take a look at our general pattern here. Again, nucleophilic addition, we attach the nucleophile to what used to be the carbonyl carbon, and then the oxygen is going to get protonated. Well, in the case of hydration, so the nucleophile is a hydroxyl group. And so you've added an OH to one side of what used to be the carbon oxygen bond, and you've added a hydrogen to the other. So overall, you've added water across that double bond. And we call this lovely species here a hydrate. So it looks like you might call it like, you know, a geminal diol. So, but it turns out it's a hydrate. So it, it doesn't react like an alcohol would. And so we're not going to call it an alcohol or a diol in, in that sense. So we refer to this guy as a hydrate specifically. And you'll find out we can do this under base catalyzed conditions or acid catalyzed conditions. And you should be familiar with the mechanism for both. And we'll see some patterns emerge that are going to be kind of repeated throughout this chapter. Now, under base catalyzed conditions, you're typically going to do this with the presence of a strong nucleophile. In this case, we've got hydroxide, basic conditions in water, whereas with acid catalyzed, we'll have acid in water, i.e. H3O plus typically present. And so in this case, with base catalyzed condition, you've got a strong nucleophile, and that strong nucleophile can just react with your ketone or aldehyde directly. And so we'll attack the carbonyl carbon, push the electrons, the pi electrons up to the oxygen. Cool, we got this guy right here, and then we're just gonna protonate this guy with some of the water that's present in the solution. So when you need some water, you just draw it in as needed. And we'll just do a proton transfer here, bronsted lowry acid base reaction. Cool. And then obviously we form some more hydroxide. So we can see that this totally is base catalyzed because the hydroxide we use in step one is regenerated in the end. And again, like a good catalyst, it is not consumed in the reaction. So, but there we formed our hydrate and it again is formed under equilibrium conditions. This is totally reversible every step of the way. No big changes in delta G in this reaction. The same thing is going to hold true in the acid catalyzed hydration reaction. Uh, in this case, though, we don't have a good nucleophile present here. We've got water present in there, and then some of the water gets protonated by whatever acid we have added to form some H3O+. And so uh, water is not a good nucleophile. It's a weak nucleophile. We learned that back with the SN1 and E1 reactions. And then we've got hydronium here, which is even weaker. Uh, it's more likely to be an electrophile than a nucleophile, or really just an acid in this case. I really shouldn't even use the term electrophile. Uh, so in this case, with a weak nucleophile present, you actually need to protonate your ketone or aldehyde first. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna protonate this oxygen. So strong nucleophiles can attack a ketone or aldehyde, but weak ones are usually not strong enough to attack unless we protonate first. And so that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna protonate.
Cool, and by protonating our ketone aldehyde, now that oxygen's got a positive formal charge, that makes it even more electron withdrawing. And so, you know, we had a fairly polar bond to begin with, so with that carbon oxygen double bond, but now that the oxygen's protonated, it's even more electron withdrawing with that positive formal charge. And now we've increased the polarity of this bond significantly. And so this carbonyl carbon's even more significantly partially positive and an even stronger electrophile than it already was. And so now even a weak nucleophile like water can attack. So I'm just gonna come around over here, still push the pi electrons up to the oxygen. That's going to lead us right here. The entire water molecule is attached. And you notice that's not quite the same thing as our hydrate we formed just a second ago. So, but when you attack with a neutral nucleophile like we did here, which is going to be the case for a lot of the weaker ones, so it ends up with a positive formal charge and you'll need to deprotonate it with typically whoever your solvent or conjugate base is. In this case, I'm just going to use another water molecule. And there we have formed our hydrate, and we also formed another hydronium ion there as well. And so once again, acid catalyzed, and like a good catalyst, the hydronium we reacted with in step one is regenerated at the end so that it is not consumed. But in both cases, we have formed a hydrate. And once again, the, the context this has come up in, a um, little bit of variety here, because the truth is forming a hydrate under these equilibrium conditions is not super helpful from a retrosynthesis perspective. You're not going to like, well, let's form the hydrate so then we can convert it into something else. You're probably never going to see this as part of any retrosynthesis process. So, but it's a great introduction here. And the truth is, if you've ever got a ketone or aldehyde in an aqueous solution, there's this equilibrium going to be existing and you're going to have some hydrate in the solution. Now, the truth is, for a typical ketone, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of hydrate. For formaldehyde, though, you'll have a fair amount because formaldehyde and then aldehydes and then ketones, that order of reactivity. And so it turns out, like, if you want to talk about the equilibrium constant for hydrate formation, for a ketone, it's not very good. It might be like 0.01 or something like this. For an aldehyde, though, it's right around 1 for a typical aldehyde. And then for formaldehyde, it's even higher, like 100 or something like that. And so you might get a question that just makes sure you know that formaldehyde is more reactive than a regular aldehyde and aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. And they might give it to you in the context of which of the following would have the greatest equilibrium constant for hydrate formation. And again, you'd have to recognize, oh, they're just having me rank nucleophiles or I'm sorry, rank electrophiles in that case. It doesn't seem like that kind of a question, but it totally is. And so if, again, it's about equilibrium constant for hydrate formation. Formaldehyde would have the greatest equilibrium constant, form the most hydrate because it's the most reactive, then aldehydes and then ketones. Now in the next lesson, we're going to look at the next oxygen nucleophile, which will be alcohols. And we'll see the formation of hemiacetals and acetals or hemiacetals and acetals, depending on who you talk to. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with these lessons, if you're looking for practice problems on ketones and aldehydes, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available.